on this episode of Launch Stories. Yes, early on, I have to do the trash. I'm CEO, Chief Everything Officer, but hopefully we're going to be designing a company in the future where majority of people spend the vast majority of their time doing things that they love to do and they are good at, which means we need to early on start having these conversations. If we have all the resources, what would be the only one, two, three things I would only focus on? Welcome to Launch Stories, the global startup podcast. I'm your host, Zoltan Vardy. The Launch Stories podcast gives you a taste of what it takes to launch a global startup. Listen to founders share their personal ups and downs, their professional wins and losses, and the lessons they've learned along the way to building an international company. You'll also hear from accelerators and investors that support entrepreneurs along their journey around the world and what they think is the recipe for startup success. So join me on Launch Stories, get inspired and learn the ingredients of a successful global business. My guest today is Stoyan Yankov. Stoyan is a productivity and performance coach and co-author of the book, Perform, The Unsexy Truth About Startup Success. He's a former film and video producer who now works with organizations and entrepreneurs to create more productive and mindful team cultures. Stoyan is a frequent speaker at conferences or across Europe and host of the Productivity Mastery Podcast, where he talks to business leaders about the habits, tools, and strategies that have led to their success. Stoyan and I will be talking about what it takes to build a high-performance business culture and why being productive is so critical for achieving startup success. Let's listen to Stoyan's launch story. Hey, Stoyan, great to see you again. Great to see you, Zoltan. It's always good to see you. Stoyan, we live in such a fast-paced world these days, right? If you think about a typical business person's uh, week, they receive hundreds and hundreds of emails. They have dozens of meetings, calls, video chats. Uh, They're managing a bunch of different projects. Frankly, it's quite insane, right? Because in the meantime, uh, there's sort of an unspoken expectation that you achieve as much as possible in the shortest time possible. Is that what being productive means or is it something different? Listen, this is uh, what productivity has been defined by, right? Uh, You got to produce the results with the shortest possible time. But the, the question is, what are the results that you want to produce? And do we actually take the time to pause before we jump into a venture, before we jump into a new project to actually define what is this desired result? Is that aligned with who we are? Is that aligned with what we stand for? And I think this is what productivity is. And people start to recognize that productivity is not just about achieving results. It's a way of living. Does this mean that being productive actually means starts with being focused? Being productive starts with being mindful. Okay. So define that to me. What, what, is, what does mindful mean then? It means that you take the time to get aware about what are the things that are important, what are the outcomes that you want to produce, and then we build it backwards and, and here with where focus comes. Once, once, you're clear, once you're clear where you want to be, personally, professionally, once you set the objectives, the targets, you align on the values, you set up a plan, then comes the focus. It's about deciding where you want to go and then creating a clear path to get to that desired outcome effectively. Effectively, yes. And I think it's, I mentioned the, it's, a, it's a mindset for a reason because it is a lifestyle in many ways. Being productive means I live intentionally, right? Like I always know why do I do what I do. I had a conversation yesterday with uh, David Allen, the creator of GTD, Getting Things Done. And he loves to give this example. You go on a holiday, what do you want to get out of this holiday? Are, are you clear what do you want to get out of this project, experience, event? And once you start living in this productivity framework, you're more living by design. And it, this comes down to entrepreneurship as well. The most productive founders are the people who are aware of what they want and they have a laser focus into staying on track into achieving it. But I think it's so difficult, right? When you're in the process of, of building a company, you've got so many decisions to make, you've got so many directions you could take. Isn't it really difficult to, to find that focus, to, to decide what is important and what is not important? It is super difficult, especially for startup founders in many ways. And I think we're going to also talk about corporates and startups at some point in the conversation, but it is really difficult to, to find what to focus on, right? Early on, you have no product. You have no market. You are trying to figure things out. Yet, I do believe there is a more mindful approach towards how to find your focus. 
because uh, Zoltan, you work and you mentor a lot of startup founders. You probably know how much waste is there when it comes to time and resources. Absolutely. And there is a smarter way. You can still be trying things out. You can still do experimentation and, and try to really figure out, uh, is there a need for my product? Uh, or if you are searching for uh, the right person to bring on board, a co-founder. But there's ways to minimize the time and effort and achieve the results that matter most. So that's that's what it is all about. And I think what I found oftentimes is there's a real disconnect between being productive and feeling productive, right? Because you might feel productive because you're t- taking off your, your to-do list uh, and you might feel like you're moving forward, but actually you might be taking off a bunch of things that really don't take you closer to your desired outcome. And I think that probably is what is what makes it so uh, such a challenge for a lot of startup funders to figure out actually you know, what are the things that they really should spend their their time on? This whole question of productivity, of performance, isn't a natural progression for you, right? Because you originally planned a career in finance, if I understand correctly, and you ended up building a video production company, um, then pivoted sometime in 2015 to what effectively is your current passion, which is basically helping companies and organizations and individuals uh, strive to become more productive and more performance oriented. What attracted you to this profession in the first place? So I'm just going to go backwards a little bit. Early in my 20s, I joined this personal development seminar and it was an eye opener for me. And ever since I've been joining uh, many, many different experiences, which were connected to self-awareness, with uh, helping me to figure out who am I, do I do things because of other people's expectations, or do I actually try and do things because of what I'm passionate about? So I ended up becoming an entrepreneur, wasn't really planning on it. Uh, so, And I spent, uh, I think, four or five years running a video production company in Denmark. But then again, coming back to one of my biggest passions, which is working with people, personal development, leadership, combined with what I learned into the movie industry, actually. I was really fascinated about empowering teams And that somehow crystallized in the next five, six years of what am I doing right now into trying to get clear what exactly is my niche in the world of speaking and consulting. And when did you first make a move into becoming a performance coach? What was that first moment in time when you decided that you actually didn't do it and you actually did something? In movie terms, we call it uh, the point of no return, right? And uh, (laughs) back in 2014, I did a coaching education in London. So that was probably Mm -hmm. the seat, Mm -hmm. but I was afraid to go out and speak and consult. So I would only do one-on-one coaching with people. And fortunately, I had a coaching client who was very caring. And I I think the guy really, he he did a lot of great things. And during the coaching, he he really achieved a lot of goals and many things. And after one session, he he just wanted to have a little chit chat. And he was like, hey, so what's up with you? Uh, You had this idea for a speech for a workshop. How did it go? And I didn't do it. I was afraid. Oh, I'm so busy. I have all these videos and everything. And he's like, look, man, you've been pushing me to achieve my goals and I'm going to give you the biggest (laughs) gift. I'm going to give you 30 days and you have to put up a workshop. I'm like, all Mm -hmm. right, man. And if you don't deliver, you have to pay 500 pounds. Like, okay. Ah, It's a little bit of motivation. So the coachee became the coach. That's right. I put an event on Facebook back in the time. Facebook events were big and invited everybody. And now I have a waiting list of uh, seven people. It's like, oh my God, I got to deliver, right? The day of the event comes, I show up. It's a full room. I do my workshop and it was called Life is Like a Movie be a freaking hero right and uh, <laughs> and i finished i honestly thought that i just wanted to survive like it was like uh-huh. oh my god it's like, so so i finished the workshop i'm just taking a deep breath i'm happy and there's this girl from china that comes just after the the workshop to, to talk to me to the speaker she never saw me before and she she was like she's so god right like she was like can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh my God, oh my God. And then she shared with me this story that she she grew up uh, in a small place, small village, probably 5 million in China, <laughs> but <laughs> right. a small, small place in China. And, and she shared this story that when she was growing up, basically men had to, men were eating on the table and women and kids, they have to wait after the men. And she said, I'm 25 years old right now. And I never took a decision for myself. I, I come to this workshop because I talk to my parents and they told me, go to the workshop. And and now you ask me to close my eyes and see myself as, uh, what is my movie? Where do I want to be? And, and I come up with, with, a, with a new story. I want to be a storyteller. I want to empower other women in China to be their own leaders and show up for themselves. And she hugs me, Zoltan, and she doesn't let go. Like, you know, I'm just staying like that. She's hugging me like this. And I'm like, I just wanted to survive this event, you know? <laughs> 
But you made an impact on somebody's life. But I made an impact on somebody's life. And this was the moment that I told myself, who am I to be afraid? What if I can touch one person with, with my experience, with my knowledge, with the questions that I ask? And that was the point of no return and me committing and say, hey, you got to go out there, man. So that's how the journey began. And you went on to work with over 300 companies, 30 different countries, uh, organizations around the world, uh, which include uh, not just uh, early stage businesses, but large corporations as well. And I actually am very fascinated about the radically different approaches to productivity that exist in these two radically different business environments. I myself have experienced them both, spending 20 years in the large corporate organization and several different contexts over the course of my career, but also having my own business, helping startup founders, being an angel investor, and so on. And you really see that if I wanted to put a fine point on it, corporations are about generating paperwork and startups are about generating business. Um, how would you compare the nature of productivity at a more detailed level uh, in these two business cultures? Yeah, that's a great question. And by the way, uh, Zoltan, this is one of the things that connected us back in the podium conference, uh, your uh -huh. speech about startups and, and corporates, which I really liked, by the way. Um, uh -huh. Definitely, there is a difference and there are some similarities, but both sides can really learn from each other. And I fully, fully agree with uh, many of the teachings that you, you are sharing. Corporates usually have good structures. They have good, good automation, roles that are ve very split up, like you have good contracts, legal side. Like so, so a lot of great structure. There are subjectives, there are KPIs. Everybody's a little bit more clear about what they're doing as opposed to startups, which have a lot of passion. They have uh, a lot of innovation spirit, entrepreneurial spirit to try out the new things, but they're often struggling to, to structure things. And sometimes they're actually afraid to do it. They, they don't want to do it. They don't want to lose this. Uh, in the book, we have uh, one of the five villains of focus and execution, which we define as the, the shiny object syndrome, right? which is which is very, very uh, big struggle for many entrepreneurs out there, always seeking the novelty, always trying the new project, the, the next thing. And the problem is when you don't have these structures, it's very difficult to, to, to build some momentum. Right. And that's the balance we should always be looking into because when you're early stage, of course, you don't know where you should be going and you got to try things out. But at the same time, you got to be really focused. And talking about productivity, that's one of the, the other things that uh, founders need to be aware of. Many of the books about productivity, they focus on personal productivity. But you're also the leader. You're responsible for your own productivity and you're responsible for the productivity of the team, which is not always so linear. It's not always about, uh, you know, people are not robots. So there's yeah. a lot more when it comes to creating a productive culture as only delegating efficiently. And I think that's what I talk a lot about in, in the, the launch mindset, which was the, the presentation you referred to at, uh, at Putum, where you actually... I mean, there are benefits to both of those uh, mindsets as much as there are drawbacks. And I think combining the two, in my mind, is, is what ultimately leads to, to success. Capturing that proper level of structure and planning that comes from the corporate mindset and combining it with a really dynamic execution-focused approach, which is typical of startups. And the two together, I think, are probably what, what, what yield uh, the best results. You mentioned the book. Let's dig a little bit deeper into that in particular, your book called Perform the Unsexy Truth About Startup Success. You actually introduce a methodology in this book that gives startups sort of a blueprint for becoming more productive. What's the origin of this framework? And why did you decide to co-author this book? Thanks, Zoltan. Uh, so basically, the book uh, is the attempt of me and my co-author, who's the uh, the CEO of one of the largest uh, accelerators uh, in Europe, Startup Wise Guys. His name is Cristobal Alonso. So we've been working closely for since 2016 now. I've been coaching uh, every Startup Wise Guys uh, batch and, and, and working on many other projects together. And the whole framework, the whole uh, seven areas framework has been actually developed uh, in a few years and working with startups, working with founders, defining what are the main areas that founders usually tend to neglect. And we wanted to put it into a very simple framework, right? So it's memorable. So we came up with this perform. And it was literally me sitting in a, in a Starbucks after working a few years with, with startups and so on, and sitting for an hour and a half in Starbucks and trying to figure out how do I make sense of these letters? Because we know what the areas are. <laughs> did you have the word before you had the, the areas? Yeah, I did. I did. I was like, oh, you perform like your purpose and values is one of the areas for sure. Effective planning is another one. So, so I had already a few areas. Um, we had them, but not like literally how they were languaged. So now I had to put it into the framework. And 
the only letter that was not really so the, the words are basically and by the way if you're a founder if you're listening you might want to pay attention to these areas and you might you might want to ask yourself am i paying attention to these areas right now so the, the the words or the areas are purpose and values effective planning roles and responsibilities focus and execution optimal energy, robust communication, and mental toughness. The first R, roles and responsibilities, was the fir- the only one, because, you know, I, I met Cristobal afterwards. He was very excited about writing a book about culture. I was excited to write a book about pro- productivity. So we decided to give it a try and see if we can do it together. And we sit together, we look at the letters, and he's like, roles and responsibilities? Who cares? I mean, everybody knows their roles, right? And we were laughing about it. And, and just like... a like a startup, we decided to, to do an MVP. Okay, two-day workshop. Let's go and let's test it with a startup accelerator. Get feedback, see if people like this, this stuff at all. Is it, does it make sense? So we put together the first MVP, did this workshop, asked for feedback. The highest rated area, roles and responsibilities. And responsibilities. <laughs> you know why? Good example of, <laughs> of, of concept and, and principles versus execution and how the two... So often don't meet. No, but uh-huh. the thing is, the thing is, everybody knows their title. Everybody knows their role, right? And I love early stage founders, the two people, three people, but I'm the CEO and I'm the chief technology officer. I'm the chief marketer. Like, of who? <laughs> you know, what, what does that even mean? But they have distinct titles, but often they don't have distinct roles and responsibilities. So the titles may be distinct, but everybody gets involved with everything, right? And that, that I think, is the, uh, the challenge. This is why probably this area is usually getting high grades, not because it's a rocket science. Nothing what we teach is a rocket science, but the fact that people don't take the time to sit down and have these discussions, right? What does that mean that you achieve marketing officer? What are the exact responsibilities that you are the last person in command? And are these responsibilities aligned with not just your strengths and skill set, but also the things that you love to do? And yes, Early on, I have to do the trash. I'm CEO, Chief Everything Officer. (laughs) But hopefully, fortunately, we're going to be designing a company in the future where majority of people spend the vast majority of their time doing things that they love to do and they are good at, which means we need to early on start having these conversations. If we have all the resources, what would be the only one, two, three things I would only focus on? What are the things that I hate to do at the moment, even if I'm good at that? And and what can we do to be clear that there's only one person accountable for a specific project or responsibility so we can be more productive? It's going to be easier for us to to plan our weeks, to plan our days, and to actually produce results. So it's simple, Zoltan. It's simple stuff. Everybody knows this stuff. It is one of the, the biggest challenges for us selling this whole concept is there's nothing new in there. I mean, there's tons of examples and practical tools, but you can find that. But do you do that consistently? Do you have a look at your company from a holistic perspective, not just the business case of the company, not just sales, marketing, product, very important things, but also from perspective of your team and your personal leadership? And I think you just touched on a very important point about this question of do you do things consistently? Because I think that's oftentimes the the biggest gap that I see a lot of early stage companies have is that they have the principles down, but they don't apply them on a regular recurring basis. And, and that somehow is that principle of planning or structure that we referred to before is where you actually get these, you know, you get clear roles and responsibilities, clear ideas of what your objectives are, clear KPIs you measure, and then you apply those on a regular basis and you do actually evaluate or sell your progress based on those KPIs and not a whole new set of things that you come up with along the way. Have you found that to be uh, a major obstacle for companies that you work with to apply the learnings of Perform? So they understand the principles in general, but they find it difficult to actually apply them in practice? To some extent, and the more they understand the the result that comes out of them applying it consistently, the more they buy into it and actually start building habits around it. But it's but it's definitely challenging. And Zoltan, you are doing lots of work with startups. You might agree with me. Almost every time I do a workshop on productivity or time management, there will be one person, usually a guy, that will raise their hand and they'll say, Stoyan, this uh, time management is fantastic, but I don't have time to plan my time. <laughs> Right, the the irony of it. Right, I mean, it's like, of course you don't have time to plan your time because you haven't planned your time and now you don't have time to plan or do anything else. It's about, it's like shower. I think it was Zig Ziglar who said it, uh, motivation is like shower. 
You got to do it daily. Planning is like shower. You got to do it daily. It's not sexy. It's not fun. But the more you do it, I mean, I, I teach people how to plan their day and they're like, what app should I use? Dude, you, you haven't, you, you don't have a to-do list. Let's not talk about app yet. If your to-do list is not good enough to give you the efficiency, let's talk about an app. You just need to spend 20, 30 minutes. I'll give you plenty of methods. Pick one, start doing it. What are my top priorities for the next day? What are our long-term goals? How do I create a plan that is, in my perspective, most efficient? And let me schedule it and try to follow through. You don't need an app. So is that the unsexy truth that you reveal in your book that you have to shower every day? That's right. <laughs> to all the founders out there, <laughs> step number one, <laughs> you got to learn to shower. <laughs> no, but that's the thing, Zoltan, right? Uh, you, you've mentioned the word. I think the key word is consistency, consistency of execution. And and you guys heard the letters from Perform. I think it's a pretty pretty good structure to begin with. You might ask yourself, sit together. We do that with teams usually before we start uh, coaching the, the teams. We ask them, have a look at the Perform framework. You can find it online. And just ask yourself and ask the people from your team, looking at these seven areas, what grade would you give for each of these seven areas, from one to 10. No BS, tell me the truth. I got to tell you, I did it once with my team and I'm like, effective planning, nine. And then somebody from my team is like, I think it's a four. It's like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> interesting. And then we had this conversation and, and, and she shares with me, well, I think you're very clear where we should be, but sometimes I come to work and we spoke the day before and you tell, tell me that we're going to focus on this, but then I come to the office and we do something completely different. I'm like, oh, yeah, because I work four more hours than her, right? So things change. Right. So you've already moved on to, to some different uh, different items. Well, that's right. But I was not so good in that specific case in communication. And having this discussion allowed me to know that as a leader, I need to be better into communicating some of these things, right? So we can we can find where the gaps and we can address them. That's that's the whole point. Say I'm a startup founder and I have this gut feeling that somehow my company is not as productive as it should be. And I'm personally not as productive. What are some signs that I should be looking at within the organization or the team or even myself that that I am in fact unproductive? Another great question, Zoltan. And I, I, I partly probably answered this question in the previous kind of discussion, but but I think it's it's first take some time off. This is something that I see with many founders that they are always on. They always and and, and we speak in the in the book also about the the metaphor of the jungle, right? As as a as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you get into the jungle, right? From day one, everybody's talking about how fancy, sexy. We're gonna build a unicorn, make an exit to Amazon. It's like uh, no, <laughs> the first few years. It's really, really hard. You're behind time from the get-go. You get into the jungle and your main task is to basically survive. Your main task is to take care of the, you know, finding shelter, aligning with great team around you. Finance, right? Short-term finance. What will keep us... At some point in my career, I had to wash dishes for close to a year to support myself, right? Like, so I had to find that way. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. And... And that's the thing. It's it's not as sexy as it looks, but but then we get into the jungle, and some people stay there. And and what we like to teach people to do is to once in a while just uh, go a little bit higher up. Every day you climb a tree, and you have have you seen some of these Indiana Jones kind of adventure movies, right? Like when the character gets lost, the first thing they do is they want to climb a tree, climb the mountain, so they can see the whole picture. So mm -hmm. so so you have to find your rhythm in between. Being down in the jungle, hustling, 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 execution, right? But then rhythmically coming back higher up and say, are we going in the right direction? Am I working too much? And I'm actually not, okay, I produced the results. I worked 16 hours, but I'm actually not fresh tomorrow. I'm not really the best leader I can be. What can I change? And this is a reflection I would recommend you do daily. And on a weekly basis, maybe a little longer, on a monthly basis, a little longer, but have these reflections. You're the leader and you're the example that everybody is going to follow. So it comes, starts, so productivity starts with identifying, getting a clear picture of where you are and where you want to go. If you take it down to a very, very practical level, I mean, literally like, you know, things I can take off the box within the next day or two, what are like the top two or three things that you would recommend that I as a startup founder do to start down the path towards productivity? The first word that comes to mind is, uh, is clarity. Am I clear where we're going? 
And was I clear enough having my team be aware where we're going? Do we have a very specific plan? And is that strategically being you know, connected with our goals? Where do we want to be long-term? Uh, as you know, Zoltan, you're coming from the corporate and you also have experience in startups, but what corporates are really good at is setting objectives and KPIs, which startups are not so good at. Do we have a clear idea where we're going? What are the results and the goals we want to produce? And then w what we're doing today, where our focus, our energy is focused on today, is that connected to helping us to make progress in these areas? So this, this is a really good checkup to begin with. Um, so getting clarity and I guess communicating that clarity to your team are our first two very important steps to, to follow. Uh, Stoyan, I think those are all very great uh, lessons and, uh, and insights. Thank you very much. Uh, if somebody would like to get some support from you for making this transition to a more productive business, what do they need to do? How do they get in touch with you? So thank you, Zoltan, first of all, for a fantastic podcast. I've been following and listening all the episodes and you guys are so good. And you guys have no idea, the listeners, how much preparation, structure and good work is being put into this. Thank you for your fantastic work, Zoltan, with all this. Uh, if people want to get in touch, uh, they can obviously go check out the uh, Productivity Mastery Another podcast in the same realm. Uh, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcast. Uh, they can go to storyanyankov.com or connect with me on LinkedIn, on Instagram. And if they want to get a copy of the book, obviously they can find the book on Amazon, Perform the Unsexy Truth About Startup Success. Thank you very much, Stoyan. Uh, you've listened to Stoyan Yankov, who is the co-author of Perform the Unsexy Truth About Startup Success. Thank you, everybody, for joining me on uh, Launch Stories, the global startup podcast. I uh, hope you got inspired by Stoyan's story, as well as some of the tips that he shared about the ingredients of what it takes to build a successful global business. So thank you very much. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with your friends. Mm -hmm.